that if we have fellowship with him, we can walk in the light. We have come to this light of Jesus, and he has received us in his grace. This is the good news. Take courage and give him your life. You may be seated. Do you know the name Karen Blixen? She's the author who wrote Out of Africa. Uh, there was a great movie about that. You may not remember it, but once I say Robert Redford, all the women in the, in the group will go, oh yeah, I remember that movie. <laughs> well, she writes uh, in a very picturesque style, and uh, I've got a couple sentences to illustrate that. She writes, I had seen a herd of elephant traveling through dense native forests, pacing along as if they had an appointment at the end of the world. I had time after time watched the progression across the plain of the giraffe in their queer vegetative gracefulness, as if it were not a herd of animals, but a family of rare, long-stemmed, speckled, gigantic flowers slowly advancing. She begins that paragraph with these words. Out on the safaris, I had seen a herd of buffalo, 129 of them, coming out of the morning mist, under a copper sky, one by one, as if the dark and massive iron-like animals with their mightily horizontally swung horns were not approaching but were being created before my eyes and sent out as they finished. Men and women, we're in Advent, and we're not waiting for the appearing of a buffalo out of the mist. We're waiting for the appearing of a Savior from the virgin's womb. Advent is a time of waiting for a special coming. Uh, when I was in college, way, way back, a little campus, the President of the United States came to our school. I noticed beforehand that things happened, like buildings got painted and rose bushes got planted, and there were guys in dark suit with sunglasses and earpieces. Uh, that's what you do when someone special is coming. Advent is the, the stuff you do when someone's coming. It's also the stuff you do and feel. You know, when I've had a special guest come over that I was looking forward to being with, I would buy a special cut of meat, and, and I'd get out the recipe book, and I'd turn on rock and roll music, and I'd be happy in the kitchen. And as it got closer, I would say to the kids, you sure need to get dressed up, and you mind your manners when our guest is here. You see, it's that feeling, that, that preparation. That's what Advent is. And Advent is also not just about anticipating someone coming in a happy sense, but it's additionally in the, the needy sense. We all have burdens, and we're waiting for someone to come and help us in a a really effective way with life's burdens. You, you remember, it came upon a midnight clear, that verse, and beneath life's crushing load. We, we wait for someone to come and help, and we wait specifically for Jesus to make manifest completely the totality of the salvation he achieved already for us. We await for him to make known to us how he has made every kingdom of this world the kingdom of that Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also a time when we not only assess our needs, but we think about his promises, those wonderful promises, and we are taking stock and waiting and trying to keep faith that he will come and bring to fruition every promise that he ever gave to us. So Advent is all of that. It's, it's the waiting for a coming. It's the things you do, the things you feel, the, the assessing of your burdens and the, the touching of his promises. That's what Advent is. And 
a little bit like Karen Blixen, but way, way, way before him, we have the prophet Isaiah use very picturesque and wonderful language to tell us about this one we await, this one who appears from the virgin's womb. Hear now the word of God, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know how it was in your house, but I know that there were times where, you know, I was ready for some super duper gadget and I ripped open the package on Christmas morning. And what did I have? Underwear. Man, you know, uh, okay. Uh, and my mom would say I needed it. And I'd say, I, you know, of course. Uh, but I also had the time where I was really hoping for a shortwave radio. And when I opened the package, it was a better shortwave radio than I could ever have imagined. We are given a gift in Jesus Christ at this season who's a little bit like the underwear and a little bit like the shortwave radio. You see, he's one we really need, and he's one who is better than we could want. You know, we're not given one in Jesus who is called, you know, God's going to give us one called uptight spiritual being. He's not going to give us one called the moral guy in the sky. No, he gives us one. What does he call him? He calls him wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Just, just tick through the adjectives. Wonderful, mighty, everlasting peace-making, peaceful. Just tick through the nouns. There he is, counselor, God, father, royal prince. This is the one God gives us. Now, we could have said, well, I, I, don't, I didn't know that that's what I needed. I was kind of, if you ask me, I was wanting to have, oh, big cuddly God in the sky. Oh, God, who gives me whatever I want, whenever I want it. But the one we're given is this one, Jesus, who's called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, I'm sure you've heard of some father someplace or some mother someplace who, you know, they, they really wanted, because of how they're made, an engineer for a son. And what did they get? They got a musician for a son. Well, don't be so pressed on what you wanted that you overlook what you really got. And the one we really got was Jesus. And Jesus is the one, whether we think we need him or not, that we truly need and in our deepest selves truly want. Well, how do we know that? Well, because it's God, the one who made us who tells us this is the one we want. You know, if you wanted advice about stock, you could go to Warren Buffett and he said, this is what you need to do, Jeff. You do it because you know how much knowledge he has, right? Well, God has way, 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 way more knowledge. And so when he gives us and says, this is the one you need, we should listen to him. I was once at a dinner party. It was fascinating. I started talking to a guy and and suddenly he just started you know, pointing out things around the house. Like this door is three inches taller than normal doors and look at the way this hinge was done. And, and I thought, why does he know? It turns out he was the one who built the house. So he, he could school me and, and, and help me understand the house because he was the builder. The one God gave us, Jesus, He's the builder. He knows how we're fashioned and what we need. 
And what he's given us, first of all, is a wonderful counselor. And that's what I want to talk about today. And then we'll look at the subsequent ones and subsequent weeks. Wonderful counselor. Now, when you think of counselor, what do you think of? Well, in our age, can you advance that next slide for me? Uh, this is a cartoon from the New Yorker. Lassie, get help. And uh, Timmy is sinking in the ocean. And then the next frame has Lassie on a psychiatrist's couch. So uh, Lassie's getting help, and the kind of help we think of is a counselor, a, a therapy kind of help. But back then, what was meant by a counselor was more like a cabinet member. We have a new administration and cabinet picks are happening, and, and that's what that would be like. Or, or maybe you want to think of uh, Raymond Burr and Perry Mason. What do you think, counselor? And it's somebody who's got an expertise who is going to help you. You might think of a priest who is a, a type of a spiritual coach. All of these fit for what it means to be a counselor. We ask ourselves, well, what makes him such a wonderful counselor? Well, I want to tell you, I think it's three things. The first is that he counsels both the mind and the heart. He instructs the mind and he encourages the heart. See, Jesus says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask and I will give it. So he's giving ideas and thoughts and wisdom for the head. But he also says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. So he's, he's doing something for the heart. And if, if we just had things for the head, we'd lose a vitality. If we just things, had things for the heart, we would lose our, our rationality. But he's 